follow the twist and I have the same problem. However, if I take it over to my joiner and make a few passes, it'll flatten the piece right out. With one face nice and flat, I now want to reduce the thickness. I want to end up with an inch and a sixteenth, so I'm going to rip it inch and an eighth and then surface plane it the rest. Now that the thickness is where I want it, I want to joint one edge to make it straight and square. Now I'll place that freshly jointed edge against my rip fence, rip the piece a 32nd of an inch wider than what I need, and clean it up at the joiner. And that's it. To cut the rails to length, I brought out my compound miter box. If you look at the prototype where the rail passes through this piece here at a half lap, across the top there's an angle for the slope of the ladder. And if I turn the ladder around towards you, we also see that the ladder is splayed. It's wider at the bottom than it is at the top. So that means the cuts are going to be compound cuts. I've taken the miter box and tipped the saw back three degrees, turned the table to 32 degrees to make the cut at each end. With the length marked, I just slide the piece through and cut the other end. Here's a blank for the horizontal piece that gets half lapped into the rail and also picks up the front of the ladder. The top edge of that needs to be beveled back so that the top shelf will fit properly. To make that bevel cut, I've set up the table saw and tipped the blade to three degrees, and I'll make a rip cut. To make the half lap joint between the rail and the horizontal piece, I've set up my radial arm saw with my stacked dado head cutter for about five eighths of an inch width, and adjusted the height to remove exactly half the thickness. With the rail done, it's just a matter of plowing out the top piece. Now let's see how they go together. Perfect. All right, now we'll do the other one. The angle for the cut is 32 degrees, and because this is the opposing side, I have to swing the radial arm to the other side of zero. Now I'm ready to make the dados in the rails to receive the steps, and nothing is simple. That dado has to be made at a three degree angle to account for the splay of the ladder. So what I've done is widen my dado head cutter to 11 sixteenths to match the thickness of the treads. I've tipped the saw three degrees, but the 32 degree angle, that remains the same. And that's the opposing rail. The front support of the ladder pivots on some pins milled in the top rail. In order for those pins to fit correctly in this horizontal piece, I have to drill a hole at a three degree angle because the ladder is splayed. So what I've done here is tip my drill press table to three degrees and I drill a one inch through hole with a Forstner bit. I've laid out these horizontal pieces from a template I took from the antique original. I'll rough it out at the bandsaw and smooth it up at the spindle sander. Now I'm ready to start easing some of the edges of the parts. I don't want any sharp edges on the ladder. For the rails, I want a nice gentle round over. So I've installed a one inch radius round over bit. And I'm just using a very small portion of the bit. I don't want a quarter round, I just want a slight taper. Now, wherever the lap joint is, I don't want to round that section over, otherwise the joint won't fit properly. So I've installed two guidelines, one at the leading edge of the bit, one at the trailing edge. I will either plunge in or stop on these lines to avoid rounding over the lap joint. Well, now I've switched to a 3 8 inch radius bit, and that gives me the round over I want on the treads. 
Here are all the treads with the edges rounded over, and you'll notice that each one is an inch shorter than the one below, and that's to account for the flare of the ladder. Now, I want to show you the wood that I picked for the treads. I found pieces with total vertical grain running from face to face, and what that does is it means that the piece will not expand and contract very much. It will not cup, and it is very strong. The next thing to do is to relieve these corners so that they'll be flush with the rails of the ladder. So I'm going to return to the spindle sander where I've tipped the table to 32 degrees, which is the slope of the rails. I've installed this clamp as a guide fence, and I've put a couple marks as stop points. With an inch and a half spindle, I'll just ride it in until I reach the mark, and that'll relieve the corner. I'll do both corners on this side, and move over to the other side, and do the same thing to the other end. It works great. After a little bit of final sanding on these pieces, I'm ready to do some assembly. Now, I want a real strong connection at these joints. So the first step is to use a good glue. And this is a urethane glue, and I'll apply a little bit in each of the dados. With this type of glue, it's only necessary to apply the glue to one side of the joint. But because it cures in the presence of moisture, if I moisten the other side of the joint, it'll give me a stronger bond. Well, they didn't have these kind of glues when that antique original was built, but I'm sure if they had them, they would have used them for a joint like this that's going to take a lot of stress. Gluing and clamping is going to do part of the job to secure this joint, but I want to add some mechanical fasteners. On the antique original, they had just nailed through the rail into the end grain of each step, and that's not very strong. What I'm going to do is angle a one and a quarter inch brad through the tread and into the other side of the rail. And that'll add quite a bit of strength. The final step is to install a screw from the underside of each tread, one and a half inches long, through the tread and into the rail. And I don't think that joint's going to go anywhere. There are a couple legs, and if you look closer, you can see that they splay out. That angle is about five degrees. Here are the pieces laid out on the bench. Because of the splay, the bottom of the leg and the top of the leg are cut at five degrees. I'm going to connect the pieces together with mortise and tenon joints. I've laid out the location on the mortises for this top rail. Now the mortise also has to be made at five degrees. I'm unable to tip my designated mortiser to five degrees, but if I make a wedge that's cut at five degrees, it sets it up so that when the mortising chisel passes in, it follows exactly on the layout line. I'm using a 3 8 inch chisel, and I've set it up for a depth of about an inch and a half. Okay, now I also need some mortises in the legs to receive this lower stretcher. Again, they have to be made at 5 degrees. Now to form the tenons. The first cut is the shoulder cut, and because the five degrees still applies, I've had to turn my miter gauge to five degrees. I've set the rip fence for a one and a half inch long tenon, and I've raised the blade a little less than three-eighths of an inch above the table. Now that's all I can do with the miter gauge on this side of zero. Now I'll swing it to five degrees on the other side of zero to complete the shoulder cuts. To make the cheek cuts for the tenons, I'm going to use this tenoning jig. It has fine adjustments so I can move it closer or further away from the blade to get the right thickness tenon. I could even tip it if I had to. Today we're using it 90 degrees to the table, and one of the real good features is this clamp because it securely holds the piece as I run it through the saw. Let's complete this top piece of the frame. Now, at first glance, you might think that this is a dowel, but it's actually a round tenon turned on the end of the piece. 
The other thing I want to do is make a relief cut here so that it won't bind up. I'll rough out for those at the bandsaw. To make those round tenons, I've mounted the piece in my lathe. Now because the tenon is at the top edge of the piece, I have to hold my tool rest a little further away than I would like to allow for clearance. I'm going to run at a very low speed and I'm going to start with a gouge and just rough it out. Now I'm going to switch to a parting tool and a pair of calipers and turn it to the right diameter. That's good. Now I'll use that as a guide to complete the tenon. That's good. Now we'll form one on the other end. Now it's just a matter of trimming off the excess. Well, let's test the fit. I've got these top pieces just held in place temporarily. We won't be able to fasten them until we assemble the frame. But we want to make sure it's going to work OK. That's good. Let's glue it up. Here all I'm using is a standard carpenter's yellow glue because these mortise and tenon joints will have plenty of glue surface and be strong. Once everything is put together, I'll simply clamp it and set it aside while it dries. I was unable to find hinges exactly like the ones on the antique original, but I did find these strap hinges. I have to make a few modifications. On this set, I just cut the tips off. I'll grind it smooth, and then I'll drill an additional hole. The spreader is next. It's made up of two pieces. There's a hinge mortised into the step and this end of the spreader. There's a surface mounted hinge underneath. And there's another hinge mortised into the rail and set on the bottom of the spreader. This end of the spreader is rounded over. We'll do that at the bandsaw. round over the edges, I'm just using a portion of a quarter inch rounding over bit. With the hinge temporarily secured with a screw, I'm now going to use a sharp utility knife to score the outline. Now freehand with a router and a straight cutting bit, I should be able to clean out most of it I'll finish it up with a chisel. I'll follow the same procedures to mortise the hinge into the second step. The glue has had sufficient time to dry, so I've removed our frame from the clamps. Now's the time to sand it smooth and ease the corners. Well, this is the last mortise that I have to make for any of the hinges. And because it's going to show, it won't do to just have it surface mounted. Now I'm ready to attach one of the top pieces, which joins the ladder to the pivoting frame. That gets set with a little bit of glue and four three-quarter inch screws.
Now with the glue applied to the other piece, there's a bit of a sequence to get these together. First I have to take the frame and slip it into the one that's already been attached. And then I have to slip the other side onto both pieces at the same time. And I'll also attach this with some more screws. Let's complete the assembly of the spreader. On the curved end, I've surface mounted this shortened hinge. And both the hinges on the underside of the spreader are surface mounted because they're not going to be seen. Now at the joint, I'm just putting another one of those strap hinges. Okay, now I'll just stand up the ladder and attach the spreader. Okay, well now we're ready for the top shelf. Now here is that shelf made up of three boards glued together and reinforced with biscuits. I rounded all the edges using the same methods that I used on the steps. I'm going to clamp it in position so that it's centered on the top of the ladder and then I'll attach it with some screws in pre-drilled holes. No glue. Okay, let's fill the counter boys with some plugs. The way to make plugs is to use a plug cutter at the drill press. This one makes 3 8 inch diameter plugs. I drill about half an inch into a scrap piece of wood, then just take a screwdriver and pop them out. A little dab of glue on the plug, and I like to align the grain of the wood in the shelf with the grain of the wood in the plug. Tap it in place and take this little saw and trim it off flush. Okay, well that takes care of the woodworking. Let's put some finish on this piece. It would be ashamed to cover the beauty of this antique wood. So to protect it, all I'm using is an oil finish. I lay on a coat which will protect the wood and after it dries for about 10 minutes, I'll wipe off any that remains on the surface. In 24 hours, I'll put on a second coat. That's all I should need. Perfect. Now, I'm not going to use this ladder to display watering cans. I'm going to use it to display my collection of routers. Actually, I'm just teasing. You know, this is going to be a very useful project, not only for display, but for light use around the house. This carpenter's glue should do the job holding the fan blades in the hub. It is a weatherproof version. Now, the important thing here is to keep the blade centered in the hub. The reveal here has to match the reveal on this side and I want to make sure that it's thoroughly seated in the hub. While the propeller has been drying, I epoxied a post into the body and at the elbow connection. A couple of these plastic washers at the shoulder point, slip it on and then put a screw in which secures that part of the arm. Now, before I can put the lower arm on, I need to take a piece of wire and wrap it around the crankshaft. Now, to make that wrap, I found that if I just take a scrap piece of my brass rod and clamp the wire to it, I can bend it around. OK, 
Okay, let's see how that fits. That's good. Now the tricky part. I'm going to lay the wire over the post on the arm and check the bottom here. And there seems to be good freedom. It's not going to bind up. And I'll bend a loop in the other end. All right, let's give that a try. Just turn the crank. A little bit of binding there. We'll make a couple adjustments. Now I think we're ready for a test run. A washer, the wire, another washer, the arm, and finally the screw. Okay, that's working pretty good. Let's give it a piece of wood to go through the saw. Just a little dab of glue, and I'll slip it under the hand, position it, and let that dry. Now I'll just spin the propeller on, and then secure it with a washer and a nut. I've mixed up another small batch of epoxy here to secure the rod on which the whirly gig will pivot. The rod is just a piece of 3 8 inch diameter solid steel. The last bit of hardware for our whirly gig is this piece of pipe. I couldn't find a single piece long enough, so I simply coupled a couple short pieces together. I drill a 9 16 hole. Here I'm using a block of wood, but it could just as well be the top of a fence post. I slide a 3 8 inch washer over the shaft that we epoxied in and the whole assembly down inside the pipe. Now, once in a while, that'll have to be lubricated, but it allows the whirly gig to turn freely in the wind. Now let me show you how we're going to paint the whirly gig. In the end, we sent it out to be painted to a friend and local artist, John Coles. We gave him some primer and some exterior grade paint. He did the bottom in red. He did the saw table and the other horizontal surfaces in a machine gray. The propeller is black. And for the woodworker, he took black and white paint and copied the image that's on our logo. The back of the woodworker is just simply black. Now let's turn on some wind and see how it works. Pretty good. Now all I got to do is find a good spot outdoors to show it off and a place where it's going to catch plenty of wind. Hi, I'm Norm Abram. Welcome to the New Yankee Workshop. Today we're going to take some more of our ancient recycled pine timbers and build an old pine bar.